great pleasure to be here with you. It's always my favorite conference of the year. And I uh, am really looking forward to sharing with you some interesting developments in this area of new and emerging treatments. Let's see. OK. So we are uh, getting smarter, if you will, in figuring out some of the different pathways involved in the immune system that are important in the disease process in JDM, including B cells and T cells and dendritic cells, not shown here, and other pathways. And we are trying to develop more mechanism-based medicines that are more precise and less sledgehammer that might take out just certain pieces of this pathway that are involved in the disease, and that might help shut down other aspects. That will allow us to do more personalized treatment for your children. These new treatments are often biologically based, that is that they, con they contain proteins or DNA or sugars or cells. And we have the potential with this type of approach to have less side effects, but really there are no free rides. Every medicine has some potential side effect. So I'm gonna talk about several of these newest treatments that are coming along in the development uh, for myositis and for JDM. The first of them is abatacept, which is CTLA-4IG, which prevents the activation of T cells. It turns out on T cells, a cell in the immune system that's very important in the disease, we have signaling molecules that would help activate them. And this, mo this molecule here, CD8086, binds to CD28 that co-activates the T cells. Um, this molecule is expressed on uh, T cells and um, Abatacept, what it does is it binds to the molecule so it won't activate the T cells. Um, and the m molecules that might be binding this abatacept in are include B cells and also muscle cells. Um, there have been some reports in refractory patients with JDM and adult myositis who seem to have experienced some benefit with abatacept treatment. And then Ingrid Lundberg in Sweden went on to conduct a study, a trial, in adult patients, 20 adult patients with active uh, dermatomyositis and polymyositis. And these were patients resistant to treatment with steroids and other medicines. So she randomized the patients to start a abatacept either right away or three months later. And they got IV treatment for six months. And in those patients who started the treatment right away, they seem to respond more at three months compared to the patients who hadn't yet been started on the treatment at month three. And this is using what Anne Reed talked about, this new response criteria that we developed with IMAX. Uh, Dr. Lundberg was able to use that in the study, and it was a more sensitive measure of outcome. And uh, these patients also, when she looked in their muscles, that she could see that there were more suppressor T cells in the muscles after receiving the Batacept treatment. She didn't find many adverse events or side effect with the medicine. There were some infections like urine, upper respiratory infection, and herpes zoster. And it was the basis of this study that resulted in uh, the company conducting now a very large multi-center international trial trying to test this medicine in adults with dermato and polymyositis, but importantly, adults with juvenile dermatomyositis and polymyositis are welcome for this study and can enter this study and try this treatment. And it is a placebo-controlled study, and enrollment is in progress. There is also another study being conducted of abatacept at the George Washington University Myositis Center. Um, this is for patients who are at least seven years of age who have JDM, and they have moderately active disease, and they haven't been responding to prednisone and one other treatment. Um, and they would receive abatacept in this study. Everybody receives the medicine. It's an open label study. And if you don't respond to the treatment by three months, you're not improving at all, then you could even go up on the dose. And there are different things being done in this study to try to figure out if the medicine is working. Some of those are in the laboratory uh, where the researchers are blinded to the medicine. So uh, patients can be referred to Dr. Rodolfo Curiel, who's the principal investigator. So there is another pathway of treatment that's being worked on as well, and you're going to hear more about that this mor later this morning as well. Um, we know from Dr. Reed's work uh, that the type 1 interferons are extremely important in the disease process in JDM and other forms of myositis. 
and type 1 interferon is increased in expression in the muscle and the skin and the peripheral blood. And there's a whole pathway that these interferons are produced uh, through signaling, through cytokines, and different molecules just inside that activate a whole pathway that causes these molecules to be produced. Um, and so we have a new set of drugs called JAK kinase inhibitors that block the signaling in this type 1 interferon pathway. They shut off the signals right up at the top, and then it doesn't allow the type 1 interferons to be produced. And it even works on other cytokines that are not shown here. So there have been these, uh, some of these drugs have now been approved for adult rheumatoid arthritis. And uh, we have had an increasing number of reports in the literature, these are case reports, uh, now more than 20, primarily of adults with dermatomyositis, but some children with juvenile dermatomyositis who seem to be having remarkable improvements if they take these medicines, particularly for their skin disease, but a few reports about benefit for the muscle and lung disease as well. So we have, we are going to hear later this morning, Dr. Julie Paik from Johns Hopkins is going to talk about this study she's been leading on tofacitinib for patients with adult dermatomyositis. And Dr. Hannah Kim at the NIH has been leading a study of baricitinib, a related JAK kinase inhibitor in juvenile dermatomyositis patients. This uh, study really resulted from a treatment program that was ongoing at the NIH in patients with monogenic interferon diseases. These are patients who had mutations in the interferon pathway and had very high production of interferon and diseases that look a little bit like JDM, a little different. And they, these medi this medicine was tried in those patients and seems to be very effective. So Dr. Kim expanded that uh, protocol to then enroll JDM patients. So four patients enrolled into this expanded access treatment program. They were uh, wide-ranging ages and had disease a number of years. And importantly, many of them had been on a number of different medicines for JDM at the time that they enrolled in the study and had pretty active disease. The study is no longer enrolling patients, but Dr. Reed, uh, uh, Dr. Kim then is able to share her early experience with the treatment, and she presented this work at the Global Conference of Myositis in Berlin in the spring. So she's finding that the four patients who received the baricitinib treatment improved in an overall diary score, which consists of muscle weakness, rash, tiredness level, and muscle and joint pain symptoms. Uh, they also significantly improved in these other core set measures that we've come to use to assess myositis and how the treatments are working. So physician global activity improved. The two patients who were weak at baseline markedly improved in their strength at week 12, and they also improved in their skin disease activity. And the patients uh, tolerated this medicine fairly well, and nobody has discontinued the medicine due to an adverse event. And these are very preliminary data, and we will be hearing more from Dr. Kim over time about the longer-term experience of this medicine and also the mechanisms of how it may be working on the immune system. Uh, but she's also starting to plan a new study with baricitinib based on these very encouraging results, a new study for patients with JDM. And then there's another treatment coming along called lenabasum. Uh, this treatment uh, targets a pathway uh, it targets what we call cannabinoid receptor type 2. It's an agonist of this receptor so that it activates this pathway, but it's a pathway that shuts down inflammation and scarring in tissues. And then um, this uh, cannabinoid receptor then is actually increased in activation on immune cells and muscle and skin cells. So it might have some potential benefit to shut this pathway down in patients with dermatomyositis. A dermatologist at the University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Vicki Wirth, who's been studying dermatomyositis for many years, she looked at this drug, lenabasum, in, the, in her laboratory and found that a shutdown of uh, inflammatory cytokines and immune cells, both in the, in the tissues and in the blood from patients with dermatomyositis. And then she actually then later treated patients with this drug and also found that the um, immune cells uh, were also shut down with the production of these cytokines and inflammatory cells. So she led then an NIH-funded study uh, looking at 22 patients with skin-predominant dermatomyositis. 
and she gave them uh, one, it was a randomized study, some patients got placebo or sugar pill, but uh, patients who got the drug received one month of half dose and then two months of full dose before coming off the drug, and then everybody got to go into the long-term outcomes portion to receive the drug in the open label phase. So she found that when uh, she did that, that patients who received the drug had a significant response in their skin activity scores called CDASI, uh, certainly by week eight and really out at month four as well. And um, then she went and put everybody on drug later after that one month period off and continued to see improvement in the skin scores all the way out past one year. Uh, patients also improved in other outcomes, like they had decreased itch in their skin, decreased pain, decreased skin symptoms overall, but she also had reports of improved muscle function as well. So this then, uh, as you heard from uh, Jim earlier, uh, Corbis Pharmaceuticals is now conducting a phase three randomized controlled trial of adults with dermatomyositis, but also accepting patients who are over 18 who have juvenile dermatomyositis. They're looking for 150 patients to enroll, requiring patients to have moderate disease activity, at least moderate skin activity and mild muscle activity. And they're going to compare high and low dose of the drug to, pay to again, to the sugar pill or placebo to see how this medicine is working. So we also have a big problem in our uh, patients with juvenile dermatomyositis of calcinosis. Calcinosis occurs in up to 30% of patients still. It occurs at areas of inflammation and pressure points. And it can be local or widespread and result in functional disability. And we've had multiple treatments tried, most of them anecdotally, calcium channel blockers, colchicine, pomidronate, and even others. And while there's reports of benefit, there's a very mixed experience, and we don't really know if these medicines work. So we really don't have any effective therapy for calcinosis. We have had several patients with anecdotal uh, experience uh, reporting improvement uh, after receiving a medicine called sodium thiosulfate. This is a repurposed drug, if you will. Sodium thiosulfate is currently approved to treat cyanide poisoning. Uh, okay. Uh, so we now at the NIH, uh, being led by Adam Schiffenbauer, my colleague, uh, we are conducting a phase two study to examine the, uh, whether cal sodium thiosulfate is an effective therapy for patients with moderate to severe calcinosis. We just opened the study uh, very recently to include children. So now children of at least seven years of age with JDM can enroll. And it's open to patients with juvenile and adult dermatomyositis who have calcinosis in at least two extremities or on their trunk or torso. And it's a rigorous study. Patients are with us. Um, uh, over five visits over more than a year's time, and they stay with us for 10 weeks to receive the treatment three times a week IV in the hospital. Um, travel and testing in this study are included, as is also true for the Abatacep study at GW. So we have a few other treatments I'm not going to be able to talk about in much detail today, but there's another one called tozolizumab, uh, which blocks signaling of um, macrophages, and it really what it does is block IL-6 uh, receptor. This is a treatment already approved for adult rheumatoid arthritis and juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, and it's being studied uh, in a multicenter study, uh, including adults with JDM, but primarily a DM and PM in adult patients. And then, do again, Dr. Paik, I think, is leading a study at Johns Hopkins in adult dermatomyositis. We have another medicine. This is actually the one medicine we have approved for myositis by the FDA, adrenocorticotropin hormone gel, or ACTH gel, um, is being studied uh, for skin disease of dermatomyositis and including adults with JDM with active skin disease and being conducted at the Cleveland Clinic. There are several other uh, studies ongoing in adult patients with dermatomyositis. There's a, a medicine, belimumab, that is blocking signaling in B cells. There are a few medicines blocking activation of the interferon pathway or activation of plasma dendritic cells, and another medicine that's blocking activation of IL-12, IL-23, another cytokine signaling pathway. 
and then another medicine, probably useful for skin disease, potentially useful, uh, that's blocking an enzyme, PDE4. Um, so we have then, in summary, a number of targeted therapies focusing on biologic mechanisms that are up and coming and uh, will be under study, trying to target the immune system more specifically for the treatment of JDM. Uh, these include abatacept, interferon pathway blockade through JAK kinase inhibitors, and lenabasum. And they're showing promise in early studies, and we need more studies, and they are ongoing, particularly for adults with JDM and some for JDM patients that are children. Um, we are in need of more effective treatments for calcinosis, and the first of these will be studied, uh, sodium thiosulfate, uh, for patients with moderate to severe calcinosis. And these and other drug therapies, I think, show um, that we hope they have a high likelihood of success, higher likelihood of success, and a higher likelihood of fewer side effects. I want to say that that's not the end of the story, that there are more things coming on the horizon if we take a broader view on things. And I think uh, I was recently inspired by several reports that I wanted to share with you uh, about treatments that are being used in other conditions that maybe someday, if we really look into the far future, that we might have potential to use these in patients with JDM or other rheumatic diseases. As you've been hearing, there's been quite a revolution in cancer treatment uh, targeting the immune system to try to shut off these cancers. And there's one treatment called CAR T cells, chimeric antigen receptor T cells, where you take T cells from patients, genetically modify them, and reinfuse them into patients to knock out the cancer. Uh, this is a treatment that's come a long way for treatment of acute lymphocytic leukemia in children, for example. And I saw a study in science recently in lupus mice that used this approach to knock out B cells uh, and knock them out for a very prolonged period of time and cause these mice to have a sustained remission from their lupus, with very encouraging results. Another treatment came out yes, last week in New England Journal of Medicine called teplizumab, which is an anti-CD3 monoclonal antibody hitting T cells. What they did, and they took patients who were at high risk for type 1 diabetes. They knew they were at high risk because they had a very strong family history of type 1 diabetes, and they had several different autoantibodies present. And they gave them this monoclonal antibody or sugar pill, and they found that patients who took the monoclonal antibody treatment delayed the onset of their type 1 diabetes by two years. And this was the first successful preventive immunotherapy for patients with autoimmune disease. And I think if we can identify genetic and environmental risk factors for these diseases and give at-risk patients treatments before they ever get sick, we have this on our horizon in the future. And finally, I'd like to, okay, that's not coming out, but uh, I wanted to show you a picture from uh, a TV show called First in Human that was put out on the Discovery Channel. Um, this, uh, it's worth your looking back at that. You can get it online. Uh, is the story of NIH and how physician researchers have partnered with patients to try new medicines for the first time in human beings. And what an adventure that is. Uh, really, in the end, it's the story of the bravery, courage, and sacrifice of the patients to try medicines that we really don't know how well they work or what their side effects are. But it's that bravery and courage of the patients that are participating in these studies that will enable us to have new treatments for JDM for all our patients. So I'd, okay. I think I can end there. I just wanted to acknowledge all the people that I've had the privilege to work with through the years particularly Fred Miller, the chief of our group. More recently, Hannah Kim and Takuki Kishi, young pediatric rheumatologists who are working on new treatments. Uh, the team at George Washington University working on the Batisep trial. Uh, Chet Otis and Ann Reed and the investigators with Rituximab trial. Uh, the people that I worked with to develop new response criteria for myositis. And we couldn't do this work without the support of NIH, with the companies that we're partnering with, and with you from CureJM. So thank you so much.